part for the introduction. I'm Amanda Cullen, a PhD student here in informatics, and I'll be the moderator of this panel discussion. Um, in a moment, I'll introduce you to the panelists and describe how everything is going to proceed. However, before I do all of that, I want to call your attention to the groups and individuals who made this panel possible. First, I would like to thank my department, the informatics department, and its chair, Andre Vanderhoek. I'd like to thank Matt Miller, the Director of Communications in the School of Information and Computer Sciences, and his staff for their hard work. I would like to thank the eSports Arena and its staff, which I particularly Director Mark and Kathy, the Arena Coordinator, who is also one of our lovely panelists. of Student Affairs. I'd also like to thank Annie Key for supporting our efforts and Blizzard for donating the swag bags you all are enjoying. But lastly, and certainly not least, I want to thank Dr. Aaron Tramiel, my partner and my advisor throughout this process. It was his dedication and enthusiasm that made so much of this possible. This panel is the effort of many who are excited about gaming here at UCI. The UCI Esports Arena opened on this campus back in September and offers scholarships to students to participate in a sport that is growing in popularity every day. The UCI Esports Arena is the first of its kind on a college campus, and I think UCI is strongly positioned to be the leader in collegiate esports. For me, the growth of eSports on this campus presents an opportunity to open discussion on a number of topics related to gaming in general and eSports in particular. Let me tell you a little bit about why this discussion is beginning with women in gaming. Sometime back in October, I can't remember quite when, I went to Aaron and I told him about an eSports tournament that I had been watching. And I described to him my frustration about what I was watching because I noticed all of the competitors and all of the support staff were men with the lone exception of one of the shoutcasters. And it felt to me like her comments were not being given the consideration that the comments of her male colleagues were being given. I was concerned about this trend continuing in esports, and with the opening of the UCI esports arena still being fresh on my mind, I shared this frustration with Aaron, and he basically said, do something about it. Um, well, he didn't just leave me hanging like that. Luckily, he connected me with the esports arena and the student affairs staff. And it was such a pleasant experience for me to meet people like Karina and Edgar and Mark and to find that others on this campus absolutely cared about the same issues as me. And I'm sure many of you care about these issues as well. Over the course of organizing this panel, I was constantly encouraged by all of the people on this campus and outside of it who supported my efforts, many of whom were women who felt that their place in the broader gaming community was uncertain. I am a woman who sometimes feels uncertain about her gaming, her place in the gaming community. It has helped me a great deal to learn about the experiences of other women, and I hope that listening to and interacting with the panelists here today will help many of you. Gaming can be such an exhilarating experience when you have proper encouragement and support. Several people in my life have supported my gaming habits extensively. In fact, my primary support group in my gaming habits has been a group of guys. So I'd like to take this opportunity to give a shout out to Matt, Drew, and Paul for letting me rename our WoW Guild to the Knights Who Say Need, because I just had to have a Monty Python joke in our guild. <laughs> Having a positive community that has supported my development as a gamer has been an important aspect of my life. I want every person on this campus, every person anywhere, with an interest in gaming to experience the joys of frustration, not the fear of frustration. As I said, it is my hope that this conversation will be the first in a series of discussions on this campus and that I will hear from additional voices in the gaming community going forward. Particularly, I would like to host panels and hear from trans women, non-binary folks, people of color, and those with disabilities with experiences in gaming who are passionate about those experiences. The possibility that those potential conversations are very exciting for me to consider. But I'm also very excited that we are starting tonight with this excellent group of women, and I would like to introduce you to them now. 
After I introduce them, I will ask them a series of prepared questions about their experiences as players, their work in various aspects of the video game industry, and some questions specific to esports. That will last for approximately half of the allotted time. In the second half, I will encourage you, members of the audience, to ask panelists questions of your own about the issues in gaming that you care about, particularly those related to women in esports. The panel will conclude with a brief period of time for audience members to approach the panelists and ask some questions in person. So please join me in welcoming, welcoming the panelists of UCI's Women in Gaming.
Um, let's see. Started playing early on in the Pokemon movies, which was us and you guys are familiar. And uh, you know, so I was pretty young when I got into competitive gaming, but uh, gaming was always a part of my life. It was the thing I did when I came home from school. And uh, my mom, you know, I had lots of crazy hobbies, and she would say, Rachel, you can do whatever you want as long as you can make a living doing it. And so, uh, you know, as I got more and more involved in games and they became more and more a part of my daily life, uh, you know, 12 years ago I met my boyfriend and he was super into games and we were both like, well, let's, let's see where this can go. So we started going to events all over the East Coast. Um, we started playing competitively online, Cal, Tivo, all that good stuff, TWL. And uh, that's when gaming, uh, the championship gaming series was on TV. So we had a lot of hopes about that. And we saw where gaming was going to go. He went out and competed in WCG 2009 in China. And we saw the, the hordes of fans that would show up and how big these events could be. And we really decided, let's, you know, <laughs> we're going to go full time into video games. So, uh, you know, we still work on video games every day in esports. Uh, I tried to be a competitor, got all the way to a reality TV show and lost and realized that maybe my skill wasn't in playing the game, but perhaps presenting the game. So, uh, Coming back from that, I decided that you know this is something I love so much, and the skills that I do have, I want to take and put into this. And so I thought I love talking about how cool video games are, how cool pro gamers are, and so I turned that into uh, an interviewing and hosting for which I do to this day. Good follow up on that one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, I'm actually, I started gaming really late, and um, my parents were freaking out because they were basically saying, oh my god, she's only playing World of Warcraft all day long, she is going to end up an addict and at home without um, a career at all. And um, I ended up applying for PhD programs um, and said, hey, I want to study games because games are awesome, and um, they make you experience so many amazing things together with other people. So I went to study communication, but focus on the social interaction um, within online games. And um, I got into a five-year funded program and hopefully be done with it soon. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's what every PhD student wants. Soon. Yeah. So soon. for each of you, if you, if you care to discuss it, um, in, considering your current position, um, how did you get your big break, and who or what helped you um, reach that point? Um, what events were going on, or what sort of people helped you um, reach that position? Uh, when I was hired by Jesse Shell at Shell Games in Pittsburgh, I had absolutely zero gaming experience on my resume whatsoever. And I have no idea why they decided to take a gamble on this 41-year-old college student who had never made a game in her life, but uh, Jesse Shell took a chance on me and another wonderful woman who was the, at the time she was the vice president of design, and her name is Sherry Grainer Ray. Uh, she is a really famous lady who wrote a very important book about uh, gender inclusive game design, so look, please look that up if you have a chance. But uh, if it were not for those two people, I would not be sitting up here, I would not be in video games, it was because they saw something in me that I was not able to see in myself yet, and I intend to spend the rest of my career holding the door open for other people the way that it was held open for me. I have a uh, you know, similar story where you know, I was a passionate fan just going to these events up and down the East Coast. I don't know if you guys haven't been out there, but VG Expo was a thing, and you know, I was in college at the time and writing papers about uh, for my gender studies class about video games, and. Actually, all the gamers I respected, and I'm pretty sure Hoffman made an appearance in that paper, but uh, you know, I, I was like, oh my gosh, all these gamers are going to be in Philadelphia, and I went down to this event, and I was like, I'm going to interview Amber and Amy Dalton, PMS clan, these twin sisters who have gotten into this all-woman gaming clan, and it was an incredible, you know, online community, and I went there, and you know, it was an event, so you know, you'd walk up, and you'd play in these little tournaments, and you'd win a headset, and you'd win a video card, and I had my big bags of winnings, and I'd walk up to Amy and Amber, and I'd plump them down, and I'm like, hey, can I interview you for my school paper? And they're like, bitch, why don't you play for the clan? <laughs> so <laughs> uh, I, I ended up joining PMS clan, and you know, there were, it, it was all my connections that I made from that, and all those wonderful people, and, and really those two wonderful women, Amy and Amber, who still work in the industry today, who did so much to, to hold the door open for me and for so many other people. So yeah, I, I want to do what you do and, and hold that door open too. I think it's great that, that 
Be nice to have a cop win on a paper. Yeah, have a paper. She <laughs> <laughs> at a conference and a, and a book test for her cop win. She's working. Um, <laughs> she likes studying. Um, I think for me, it was mainly, it's mainly two researchers that if you do want to learn more about um, the academic side of how to look at um, esports and also how to look at gaming as an inclusive space, would be Adrian Shaw, Gaming at the Edge. It's an amazing book. And uh, T.L. Taylor, um, Raising the Stakes. And as far as I know, she's writing about esports and streaming right now, too. So this will be a good one to look at for sure. Adrian's actually also a badass hockey player, you guys. <laughs> Do not mess with her in a hockey <laughs> <laughs> um, So I guess for me, I think I'm just talking to you, Mom. I'm talking, sorry. Uh, I guess for me, I actually really didn't like the internet uh, when I competed, because people kind of always would focus on me being the girl. Um, like, I know <laughs> when I hit rank one for World of Warcraft, uh, there was like this website called skgaming.com and it would like add up your two, threes, and fives rankings and it would give you like a, a world ranking. And uh, I hit number one, yay, in the world, called it for like a month. And uh, they came out with an article saying, best female gamer. <laughs> and instead of just saying like, you know, just giving me credit, uh, they kind of like tacked on that like gender thing. And I, I just felt like my entire like uh, pro career was focused on me being a girl and first girl to win MLG, first girl to blah, 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 blah. And I just really hated it. So uh, after I quit for a while, I decided to like never, ever, ever tell anyone I was a girl when I ever played video games. And <laughs> when my friend told me that I should start streaming, I was like, there's no way that I'm gonna like put myself out there again. Like why would I wanna go through this again? And she said, if you have good content, then why are you gonna let people put you down? Like no matter what you do in life, people are gonna put you down. So you're just gonna do nothing in life. And uh, that really resonated with me. That was uh, HP Starcraft. If you guys know him. And uh, yeah, he was like, "Dude, I'll stream with you. We'll play together. It'll be fun." And um, I think the first day that we streamed together, I think I had like 3,000 viewers or something. It was really, really insane. So I got a really lucky big break there from knowing him and getting that huge push from him. And for just being an awesome gamer. <laughs> yeah, that helps a little bit. Um, for me, I kind of got my big break, I guess, just getting involved in clubs at school. So high school wasn't really involved in anything, didn't do anything with my extra time, just kind of played games all the time. So social clubs weren't really my thing, but coming to college, I really have to thank the people that took the first step in creating those clubs. So we had a really strong StarCraft club at the time. Legal Dutchess didn't have a club, but it was founded my year. So I thank all the people that founded that club. I wasn't super involved in year one, but I did join the club very shortly after it was founded. And just the meeting people and just kind of being a member and a club member first before jumping into any sort of leadership position helped me understand what it was like to want a community and have a community that I could hang out with and play games with. So that was really the first time I got involved in what I do today. And obviously for my current position, or a coordinator, I have to thank Mark Duffy for reaching out to me and the student community when he was looking into creating an esports program at UC Irvine. He talked to us first, knowing that you can't create something out of nothing. You have to have people that really love what you're going to do and create. And so he came to us and asked us for kind of advice um, as like experts in the space, because we were kind of the experts at UC Irvine. And I'm really thankful that he didn't forget about us when pitching this to administrators and had us every step along the way. And that's been really cool. And um, I got the position sometime after I'd already begun helping Mark, um, kind of pitch the idea and reach out to sponsors and stuff like that. And um, I guess they thought I was good enough. So thank you. <laughs> and it's been really fun. I really love what I do here. And um, I couldn't have done it without everyone that's kind of told me that I'm doing a good job and that I can actually make it in this industry and make a difference in where I found my home in the first place. So it's really incredible. Thanks, Ethan. Um, so if you care to, um, sort of maybe describe like your first encounter that you remember with like video games, um, your first encounters with like video game community and what that felt like and maybe how it influenced your trajectory to where you are today. 
I'll skip this one. I actually remember pretty clearly because I never played a video game before, and I played World of Warcraft, and I got on my uh, friend's Ventrilo. If you guys remember that, <laughs> I was gonna say that. But uh, it was like this group of like 20 people in this one chat room, and everyone's kind of talking over each other, and all of a sudden, ping, and then everyone shut up. <laughs> that like a young boy? Is that a guy? And as soon as I don't know, I thought I was like the shit, because everyone wanted to play with me after, and everyone wanted to help me, and it just, it's really cool. I mean, if you think about it, right, like, you're sitting there with, like, if you're a guy, 20 girls, are just like, what? Oh, can I help you? Can I hang out with you? Can I, you know? Uh, so it, it's like a really surreal experience, especially, like, back then, this was like, oh, man, <laughs> like, 12 years ago or something, but, um, yeah, I mean, I, it took me like a while to realize, I was like, oh, I'm not that cool, I just have a vagina. <laughs> <laughs> and then it kind of changed it really cool. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, uh, yeah, I mean, that was my first experience, but I, I just remember it very vividly, because it was like, oh, this is, this is new, this is cool. I actually can't pinpoint my first experience before we began. Um, I think I just, I don't know, like my parents bought my sister and I like the Game Boy Color at some point. We played Pokemon on it, stuff like that. Um, and I'd get invited to like all the guys' houses to play like Super Smash and stuff like that because no girl was on console. So I'd end up at all these like the guys that I met, I guess, through school and through my parents' friends. Just hanging out. But I didn't really consider myself a gamer or I didn't think gaming was a hobby, it was just a thing to do when you hang out with friends sometimes. So that happened to be an activity of choice for the day. Um, I guess my first experience that I really can remember is when I started playing online games. That's when everything changed for me. Um, because kind of similar to what Haku experienced, I guess, like people made a big deal if they found out. So I actually lied about my age and I lied about my gender all the time saying I was like, yeah, I'm a 19 year old teenager or something. But I was actually 10 years old um, playing Ragnarok <laughs> online. And, um, I just pretended to be older than I was and just like talked a certain way to try, like, yeah, I go to high school and, you know, just kind of making things up. And I'm pretty sure my portrayal of a high school guy was very inaccurate, but I guess that kind of made me stand out a little bit too. So I kind of climbed the ranks in the guild and became an officer and kind of started doing cool things in that universe. And uh, ever since then, I haven't really played many other games other than online multiplayer games because I just, that's where I feel at home and I like socializing with people when I play. Why did you tell them you were a 10 year old girl? I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I think and I actually the guild leader of that guild found me like seven, eight years later when I was actually in high school. And it was because I was using like the same handle somewhere else. Not actually, like, I should have done that. Because he would never have found me otherwise. But he's like, hey, um, so you're a girl. Because I had like a profile picture and I was like, yeah, uh, sorry about lying about everything. But you know, so now she, he knows my name. Like he added me on Facebook like a couple years ago. Is this chill? Kind of. I feel cool bad? Not really. Not <laughs> <laughs> so bad at all. Well, I'm the old lady of the bunch, and this story is about to prove it. Uh, my first interaction with video games came in 1979 when everybody else in my class had an Atari 2600, <laughs> except for my sister and I. We were literally the only people in our class who didn't have one. So when Christmas was coming, we wanted that more than anything else in the world because everybody else had one and those were so cool. We, we were just like the, the kid in a Christmas story wanting that Red Rider beef gun, you know? <laughs> we're like doing extra chores and we're like sucking up to our parents and everything and everything to get that Atari 2600. And then uh, Christmas morning happens and we come downstairs and there's this beautiful, huge box under the tree and we're flipping out. We're like, oh my God, oh my God. And we open it and it's a pond. And my dad is like, isn't this cool, kids? And I'm like, yes. So I think it was that trauma of that Christmas that like, <laughs> made me completely obsessed with video games because it's like it was something that I was not allowed to have, so that made me need to be part of it anymore. And I think the first time I ever realized that I was part of a gaming community was uh, when I'd been playing online games as a housewife. Uh, my husband at the time had uh, 
had a fantasy baseball draft every year, and his friends would fly in from all over the country and have this fantasy baseball draft. And um, one year, you know, they're all sitting around there watching TV, and they're, you know, they're eating pork rinds or whatever those guys do. And and the one guy says something or other about Dark Age of Camelot, and I just went, Oh, Dark Age of Camelot! And then I just I just rattled off like this ten minute dissertation about Dark Age of Camelot. And I suddenly look around the room and like every single one of my husband's friends <laughs> has their mouth open. And I'm like, oh, wow, did I just do that? But that was like the first time I realized, oh my goodness, you know, I'm part of something that these other people are part of too. And we, we can geek out about it and it's so cool. And yeah, don't, don't anyone ask me about Dragon Age if you want to look at it. That's all I <laughs> Okay, you go. Um, I actually want to talk about an experience which may be more go into what I'm doing now research-wise, which is kind of like half loose, but more on the negative side in that regard, because I was also in a, in a world of worker field, and um, I, I climbed the ranks and ended up being healing officer, and I made call-outs during raiding, and some guys just wouldn't freaking acknowledge me, and I would start yelling at them because I thought they just wouldn't hear me, or my microphone was too low, or whatever it was, right? And I, I felt like I had like the direct opposite experience because I didn't even understand what the heck was happening. <laughs> and and um, until one of the guys, um, one of the other officers in the guild was like, you know what, you just can't change one of these guys. Sometimes they're just assholes and they just, you know, they just don't listen to you. It's like a military guy. They just can't deal with having a boss who's a girl. And I'm like, oh, wait, what? Well, that's what it's about? I thought like he was just like, oh, maybe she's bad or, right? I was like searching for like, was my call wrong? Was like, was I making a bad decision? And I went through everything because I couldn't figure it out. And it was like, oh, it's just because you're a girl. It's like, oh, well, that's great. Thanks. <laughs> but uh, I guess um, it, it got me to do researching what I'm doing now, so that's good. <laughs> I keep, I've, I've been trying to think of like the moment that it that it got really big for me, but gaming has sort of always been like, you know, the, the background noise in my life and like the, the thing I've enjoyed. I think if I really have to think back, it was like back in the day, my mom used to be the one that would that would work on computers. My dad would go to the office and stuff, but she would she would work on computers and she would go to these sales where you could buy like boxes of floppy disks for like a dollar and there'd be like twenty floppy disks in there. And she comes home one day with Crystal Caves, which is like a Mario clone knockoff. And she's like, Rachel, we're going to play video games today. I'm like, oh, that sounds awesome. And so she would put it in the computer, and she would play. And I would stand, this was early Twitch TV. And I would stand behind her, and I would just scream, and go like, John, I'm going to And like, for some reason, like, that, you know, just being in that situation, and that, that social interaction with my mom, and, and that was our play time and our hangout time. Then we got the Nintendo in the house, and we'd all play together. Like, video games were, were uh, a nexus that we kind of revolved around the way I think some people get together over movies or books or shows. And uh, you know, I've, I've always tried to, to seek out that kind of relationship in my life with people who's going to get together and play games with me, who's my friend based off their willingness to do this thing. And so uh, you know, it's, it was so exciting actually the moment that we got to, to, to see video tournaments in real life. It was uh, Digital Life 2007, I think, when Grubby and Moon were playing. And Grubby uh, lost to Moon, unfortunately. Moon playing with a broken arm. It was like the most incredible match. And I just remember like being like, what are they doing over there? Oh my, God, this is amazing! And just standing in the middle of like a freezing cold, you know, New York Javits Center, you know, empty warehouse, and just watching this video game be played, and being like, I can play video games with more than just the people next to me. Like, this is a thing. This is a, a universe. And I, yeah, there's no turning back. So, I found it. That moment. That was it. Grubby Moon, 2007. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, <laughs> I actually have never experienced that. Um, or even more of like, oh, did you see that? Was, that was Warcraft 3, like yeah. back in the day of uh, mm-hmm. digital life. <laughs> um, so, having, I guess, gone through those experiences you now, um, where you are now, um, what would you go back and do differently to um, achieve the ex- success um, for the position that you have now? Uh, I actually wouldn't change a thing. I mean, I kind of brought up like a fun experience, but I remember for like arenas, when arenas first came out, I was supposed to be on a team with like my friends, three three of my friends who are like officers in my guild. And uh, the day that arenas came out, they basically told me I couldn't play them because I sucked. And I did suck. 
but they were really, really good. And in the first week, they actually got like rank two on the battle grade. And I played with some random people. And I was like rank 300 or something, really, really shit. <laughs> And I was like, no, screw that, dude, I'm going to beat them. And I felt really excluded because, I mean, I was like a 14-year-old girl. <laughs> so I was like, probably wasn't going to be very good. I wasn't very good. But because of that, I was like, no, I'm going to beat them. I'm going to beat them, I'm going to beat them, I'm going to beat them. And I think it took me like a month or so, and I got rank one. And I beat them on the way there, and it felt so good. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> it felt so good. But it was out of spite. And <laughs> Tried as hard if they like if they had taken me on the team I probably would have tanked them like real tough but <laughs> because I felt excluded um, I found a random person who didn't know who I was played with him and uh, I refused to talk him in trio I was like oh my mic's broken until we hit top twenty and then I started talking and I, I like my voice is pretty high but it was like it was high back then so now I'm gonna take him seriously. But like once we hit top 20, I started talking on then, and we just grinded our way to rank one. And it was, oh, I just remember like seeing like the one next to my team, and I was like, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I actually, I don't know. I feel like part of it is like, part of the struggle makes you better, if that makes sense at all. So I actually wouldn't change it. I think the thing I'd change is I would have gotten into video game development earlier. Because um, I didn't do it until I was 41 years old. And that is partially because, you know, I've been playing games all my life. And I guess on some level, you know when you're playing a game that, like, human beings are playing this game that you're playing. But I never really thought about the people who made the games and thought about, you know, all the different work that has to go into making a game. It just had never occurred to me before that that's a job. And so when I found myself at a creative career seminar at Carnegie Mellon, and I'm in this panel of video games, and I see a woman on stage who works for Shell Games, that moment completely changed my life. Because all at once, I realized, video games is a job? Holy shit. <laughs> Second of all, oh my god, women do that job? How cool is that? And then the third realization was there's a video game company in Pittsburgh. I'm going to work there. I, I'm just, I'm going to work there. And I just, I pestered the living crap out of them and ended up working there. But all it took was having somebody show me this is available to you. So I think if I would have understood earlier that this is available to you, um, I might have gone into it sooner and I might be, you know, even further along than I am right now. But I guess uh, one of the things that's been really thrilling for me is to go out to schools and you know go out to places like this and say to people, this is available to you. <laughs> because that's just not anything that I understood until I was 41 years old. Um, so that's, that's what I would change. And I would also change the fact that I hugged John Romero at GDC without knowing who he was. And um, <laughs> the nerve rage that ensued when I said, why should I have known who that was? <laughs> That was a mistake. I might have studied up a little bit on who the famous game developers were for GDC that time. <laughs> I'm having a lot of trouble coming up with an answer for this one. <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to make you have regrets, Kathy. Oh. <laughs> no regrets. <laughs> I kind of live by that mantra. So I feel like, like when things go wrong or I had a bad day or something, I'm just like, oh, I probably learned something from that. I don't see it now, but I'll see it eventually. So, um, yeah, I don't know. It's just do what you love and keep doing it. And I think that's, I mean, one of the things, you know, that esports has going for it that a lot of other industries don't is there's no one ahead of us who has, has done it right. There's no path to follow. Like, all our bumblings and all our screw-ups and everything that we try and fail at is still so important and valid in the process to advance in esports. It's hard to feel bad about any of it. Every mistake we made, and you know, especially when we, you know, the cool thing about esports, I think a lot of people make mistakes that are very visible or they, they're very open about talking it, and, and it helps the whole scene move forward and learn. And so I think that, you know, every time, you know, we, we screwed up, it's, it's been for the best in, in esports, just because there's been sort of this great theme about communication and, and discussing what goes wrong and, and accepting people anyway. You know, 
we work in live broadcasting, so. <laughs> well, that's, that's very true in game development, too. I mean, the number of times that something has to fail and not work before you have a game that's shippable, I mean, you have to be willing to take risks and you have to be willing to fail um, because without that, you don't move forward. And then, you know, I can see that being true in esports, and I've experienced that just being in game development in general. And um, I guess one other thing I'd add is don't be intimidated by the technology. Because when I first started, I was scared to death of the technology. Oh my God, scripting? No, I can't do that. But as soon as I got past the mental block of thinking, you know, I'm just going to slow down. I'm just going to look at it. I'm going to pay attention to it and, and just figure it out. Just figure it out and take it in teensy weensy baby steps. Um, if you'd have told me 10 years ago that I'd be coding state machines in C Sharp, I'd have laughed at you. Um, and the reason it took me so long to get there is I was afraid of the technology. So don't let it intimidate you. It can be done. There's a lot of resources available to help you. What about when you go to DC and you go into a room and you realize, oh, there's, uh, well, there's one woman in the front, uh, and me, because <laughs> that happens. Yeah. How intimidating is that one? Um, I've actually gotten used to it um, because it happens so often. Um, I will say that GDC in particular has gotten a lot better about being more inclusive in recent years. I mean, and that's not just with its speaker roster, that's also doing things like um, installing childcare to make it easier for female game developers to go to GC. It's like uh, things that they do, like putting in gender neutral bathrooms. I mean, they are paying attention to ways to include women in those conferences. Um, PAX, uh, you know, PAX East, PAX, PAX Prime, PAX South, um, they have something called an AFK room. If somebody is feeling really overwhelmed or upset by something, they can go to these rooms and um, they can just calm down or they can have professional counselors there to talk to them. These are steps that different conferences are taking um, to make it easier. And it's really great to see that it's getting better. There's still work to do. There's still certain conferences that have a lot more work to do. But I have seen it just in six years getting incrementally better. It's definitely gotten a lot better. Like my first event, there were like no girls. I think MLG, MLG San Diego, 2008 was my first gaming event. I'd never been to like a gaming event before. Um, I didn't know the world existed. And it was like booth babes and then me. And that was it. <laughs> and I was like, oh my goodness. Uh, I felt really, really, really out of place. And now, like, when I go to an event, it's like there's a lot of girls. And not just there, like, I feel like through the years, I saw more girls go as like the girlfriend, the tag along girlfriend, or the sister, or, you know, like the friend. And now I see just like girls going. Yeah. Yeah, and it's, it's actually awesome. So, I don't know. From my experience, like year after year, I do see like more girls showing up because they're interested in games. So, sort of touching on something that Heidi was just talking about. Um, each of you, what are your thoughts on the sort of like um, accommodations that say that conferences are making to um, accommodate women and maybe sort of their different interests and their different needs? Um, what would that look like in like a broader, just sort of in the sense of like gaming community or um, esports in general? Like what can be done to um, accommodate women and maybe their differences? I'm gonna get controversial, you guys, okay? So um, I, I think that there is a definite Thing that's occurring, and this is occurring in game studios and also at conferences, when you're looking at a ratio like the one we currently have, where it is only 13% of women who are game developers, if you have a situation where you're on an expo floor and you're giving away free alcohol and there's a ratio issue there, the women are completely outnumbered by everybody all the time and you are encouraging people to drink alcohol, um, you are placing women in a situation where they may not always be safe. And I am not suggesting that we stop partying. I am suggesting that studios and conferences begin to recognize that the amount of alcohol in gaming culture and at gaming events and it freely given away at gaming conferences can endanger women simply because of the ratio. And until the ratio changes, that's going to be the case. 
I think one of the biggest things that I've seen just in attending events over the years is, you know, these events are, are mostly like sprawled out over, over large open spaces. And so a lot of the personal interactions between people kind of aren't open to the scrutiny of security or, you know, what's going on. But what I've seen time and again, and especially more and more, and it's, I, I stop my girlfriends, my heart is warmed every time when, you know, more and more girls are showing up and inevitably some of you wonder why she's here, look at that skirt. And dude friends will be like, hey, bro, leave her alone. Or, you know, another chick will turn around and be like, dude, people are speaking up is, is the biggest difference that I've seen between how it was early on and, and how it is now. And a big part of that is the ratio. More women are here. There's, you know, by numbers, maybe more outspoken people. But I think also because of conversations like this and because of, you know, the increase of women in gaming culture, you know, people are learning to look out for each other. And especially kind of when, when the outside kind of attacks gaming, that's when we sort of need, you know, each other to be strongest. I think, you know, the, the best thing we can do for, for gamers going forward is to check off all those, those terrible stereotypes. And this is such an easy one to get rid of. And I'm so excited to see gaming become one of these bastions for inclusivity. Especially, oh my god, I just shout out to Overwatch. You're doing such a good job. I play this game and I play with so many women and I play with, you know, so many people that I don't think I've, I've had the opportunity to play with before, or I don't know because no one's using their microphone, so I do have to say it's getting better. But Blizzard in particular, um, I want to call them out for taking the amount of care that they took to design the characters in Overwatch, because they have a group of employees on their campus that is an LGBTQIA group of employees that meets regularly, and when Overwatch was um, getting started and they were in the concepting phase, they included that specific group of employees in concepting these characters because they wanted to be diverse and they wanted to do it right. Did they get it 100% right? Maybe they did, maybe they didn't, but the fact that they cared and the fact that they asked, that is humongously important. So caring about it matters, asking about it matters, and I want to absolutely back up Rachel on what she said about if you see something going on around you that's just really not cool, speaking up is the best thing you can do, particularly if you are a male. Oh, can I just say, I freaking hate the term white knighting. Oh my gosh. Uh, I think I think there's definitely white knights, right? Like the, the term is used when someone is just sticking up for you because they want to get in your pants, right? Like, there is that, and that will still exist, and that is white knight. But I feel like that term is thrown around so much in gaming. Like, if you stick up for a girl in any way at all, you're just like a virgin white knight. And like, oh, it's so bad. So yeah, I mean, what Rachel said, I think it's- Let like, it bounce off, you guys. Yeah! You know what? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Can I say something about the, 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 the researching perspective there? Because I've actually just thought about this a lot, because I, I played one night of Overwatch games and got really frustrated because I had a lot of run-ins with a bunch of guys who weren't great. And when someone tried to stick up for me, the usual will happen. Oh my god, and here comes the white knight, you're so lame, does she really need your protection? Mm -hmm. And it goes on, right? And so I, I ended up writing like a little essay afterwards because I was so angry, where it's like pointing out, whenever a girl enters your game and she say, oh my god, it's a grill, <laughs> First thing is like, you're othering the person right from the start. You're calling her out. You're saying, you are different from us. And what happens then if a guy stands up just because, not because they want to get in their pants, but just because they realize you're doing the wrong thing right now, bro, right? Then they get white knighted, which basically just puts them in the other category too. It's just another version of, oh my god, it's a grill, or Oh look, a gamer girl, or all of these that you've probably all heard <laughs> before. Um, and then calling out the white knight is basically the same uttering process to point out we're the in group and you're not part of us. And from there on, it just like gives way for a lot of processes around social interaction, which you can only basically apply to the out group, right? If you perceive them as as bad, as dehumanized, as everything. Like from there on, it just takes this whole um, avalanche of other behavior. So yeah, don't, don't, don't ever call anyone on my hands, please. And don't say, oh my god, it's a gamer girl. <laughs> so, yeah. I guess I'll just kind of add a little bit to that, is that um, in all of my, my guild experiences, 
on all these online games that I've tried playing, um, I kind of, you know, know I can't even try it. And every time I'm in the guild, um, I feel like some of the harshest jokes actually come from the other women because they're so used to being the other and the outgroup that sometimes to try fitting in or try and be part of the people, of, you know, the cool people or the people that are funny or can take a joke, then they'll say really hurtful and mean things that they don't necessarily enjoy being said to them, but because that's the way of fitting in, they do that. And I've, I found that it's actually very effective to kind of talk to the people that are doing these things, not the, just the women, but the people that are setting those examples, um, and say, hey, I don't know if you realize what you're doing, but this is kind of what you're doing, and this is how it makes me feel, or when I stand up for another girl, it's like, this is how we feel about it and why I'm doing this. And people usually will realize what they're doing and be like, okay, yeah, that wasn't cool, I'm sorry. Um, and I think that's really, that's a helpful thing, honestly, sometimes just to talk to people about it. To not like call them out and start claiming them back, that doesn't help anything, it just makes people more defensive. And um, you know, that's just kind of how I deal with things in all my games. Okay, yeah, I wanna, I wanna kinda continue the line of thought and uh, something I think that both um, Nina and Rachel have touched on. Um, so like, what do you guys kinda see if it's some of the myths around women in games and or women in esports and like their abilities and their, their skill level and include like video game development and how do you guys go about like, sort of addressing those myths in your in your careers or your daily lives? Well you're a woman who works at a game company. You must be in HR or marketing, right? <laughs> or you must be somebody's boyfriend, right? Um, so there's that. Um, there's been research that came out lately saying that women over 35 um, are, are this wonderful gaming market that all these casual game companies are trying to uh, trying to capture right now, and they they are absolutely convinced that those women only love hidden object games and match threes, <laughs> and that's the one that that makes me the most angry because I'm like, no, man, I'm up in the Mass Effect. Come on. <laughs> and I think the most annoying thing is that there's an idea out there that there's a, only one way to be a girl gamer, and you know, you're what you get in it for the attention, you get to snag guys, and like, like I, I think if you know people could just, you know, look at each individual human being and not say, you know, I, I, it's it's the the need to put everyone in a category and then the need to to decide which side of that category you're on, and that's why you know I, I think. For example, the white knighting situation we discussed, it's a game of numbers. And so like when you when you don't speak up, when you don't, you know, assert yourself as you are, you kind of get mentally put into these other categories by people. And so, you know, it's it's so hard to, to kind of stand up, especially, you know, when people are attacking you and people are calling you out online and stuff. But oh man, I'm falling off here. But what I'm saying is when when somebody stands up and asserts himself and, and says who they are. It's okay to support them and, and not agree with them and just say I'm here with you and I'm just amplifying your message and I'm just standing behind you because I think uh, you know the biggest misconception is that all gamer girls are one type of person and you have your match three people who just want to play match three and you have your Mass Effect gamers and you have your competitive gamers and and being interested and wanting to find out what kind of gamer a person is is so much better than, than trying to decide for yourself and say they should be any one way. There's also a thing about how if you don't have a certain level of knowledge about a specific fandom that you ascribe to, then you don't deserve to be in that fandom. That, uh, that can get really annoying too when you have people who nerd check you and like try to, well, we don't really believe that you like Firefly, so we're going to grill you about some throwaway line that, that Mal Reynolds said in episode three, and if you don't answer the question correctly, then you clearly aren't a real Firefly fan. No, you know? If people want to like something, they're allowed to like that thing, regardless of how passionately they like that thing or how much they know about that thing. I think that, can maybe talk a little bit, but I think that um, there's a lot of discussion on like, are girls and guys equal in gaming? Like skill level, and I've always been in the belief that that it's equal. But the thing is, um, I don't know about how many girls are in the audience, or how many girls can relate to this. But I know, I know you grew up with games, but I didn't grow up with games, and I, I grew up being told that I should play with dolls, and I really like Barbies. <laughs> and you know, like 
games were for guys. And I got stuck in the rules, and I was totally fine with that. Um, but I felt like if I had started playing games earlier, I would just be so much better. Like, I don't know if you guys remember your first experience playing like any type of game. Like, I remember playing World of Warcraft for the first time. I couldn't freaking move. Like, I actually didn't know how WASD and like, I think I hit level 8 without like buying abilities. It was really bad. I just like chain died. Like, I didn't know what the hell I was. I didn't know how to whisper people. Like, all these skills are mechanics that you learn. And like, now that I've played WoW well, and I go to a new MMO, I know how to do these things, right? It's like very similar. And we're like MOBAs. Like, when I play League of Legends, I chain it into the wrong tower over and over again because I thought red just meant bad and blue is good, right? Like, no, it's not hard. Um, it took me a long time. Uh, but you know, I still like could climb eventually. And um, just Carson, like what I stream now, I lost the tutorial on stream. Never played a card game in my life. Now I'm pretty good. So, <laughs> I mean, if I had just like done this at a younger age, like I would have overcome a lot of the skill gaps. And I think it's just like a, like a societal thing, right? Like I think if when girls start playing games at the same age as guys, and they're more encouraged to play at a younger age, that will see more competitive girls. So. Yeah. See, I think it's awesome that you said that you like Barbie, right? Because it's okay for girls to like Barbie, <laughs> but it's also okay for girls to not like Barbie, right? And there seems to be this overarching idea among marketing professionals that women will buy it if you make it in pink. I think they will. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah, they will, but many of them will be like running away in the other direction, you know? And so I don't, yeah. I wish that people would get over this idea that there are games for boys and games for girls and toys for boys and toys for girls. It's like, they're just toys, unless you're operating it with your genitalia. <laughs> um, it is not for boys <laughs> Yeah, there should be four girls, maybe. but so and so on. Well, people 
want to see, you know, I want to see somebody who's like me in the game. And I think that's how everyone feels, no matter, you know, whether they have a hard gender or whether they're not cisgender. I mean, no matter who you are, you are more enamored of a game when you can see yourself represented somehow in a game. And that's true of games. It's true of game development <coughs> studios. You know, we want to see pe more people who are like ourselves, and that makes us feel like it. It's true experience, too. So, um, yeah, I mean, having more girls trying to stream and seeing more girls play games is really, really important. So you should actually try something. <laughs> yeah, you can be like, how can we get money with it? So what do you think can be done um, so to help maybe like, some of the young women sitting in this audience to um, to be where you are, um, what can we do to increase the number of young women in video game development or streaming or esports? Just do it. I mean, she just says that like girls at a young age think they can't, and it's like a mental block. I've actually never felt that way when I was at anything. I, I, that that just blew my mind when you said it. I've never thought that like I can't do this, and so that's a, that's a really sad thought. I don't know. I don't know how normal, is that normal? Is that <laughs> it's, a pretty, it's a pretty well discussed social psychology process. Yeah. I don't think I've ever right. felt that way. It's actually the opposite. When someone tells me, like, you can't do this, I'm like, no, bitch, I'm going to do this. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, I mean, just don't be afraid to fail. Like, I think what I loved about games is the fact that you can lose. Like, competitive gaming is like, I love losing, which sounds weird, but it means that you can get better. And I think that like that's the best part is like you can get better. Someone can beat you, which means you can improve, and then you can beat them until there's no one left to beat. Right? Like that's, that's just the best. Well, I can give you like a live example of someone that thought she couldn't do anything, so didn't. So nice to meet you. And that was definitely something that I believed when I was a kid. And um, like since I I didn't not playing games as a young kid. I was 10 years old playing games, obviously. So I wasn't one of the ones that started playing really late, but I was definitely one of the ones that thought I had to be in a box or I had to be a certain person to be good at games. So I was very, very afraid of failure. And this wasn't just in games, this was in a lot of things. Like um, I was scared of not getting first in piano competitions, so I wouldn't practice. Um, <laughs> my parents are there and they can kind of test me as well. Um, I was just scared of not being the best at everything I did, so I kind of just kind of tried, but not super hard. So if I got second place, I was like, yeah, I deserved that second place. So it was the same with games. Um, all of the guy, my guy friends were a lot better at games when I started, and I guess that was actually discouraging for me when I was a kid, because I was like, they already know all these things. They know all, the, like, for League of Legends, right? They all know every ability. They know all the counter picks. They know like all these strategies and I'm sitting here like, I have to study before I play. And that just seemed like putting in so much effort and like hearing what Haku has to say is actually very encouraging and I think everyone has to hear that. Um, just knowing that it's okay to fail and now I'm obviously um, in a position where I can tell myself that I've done things that had a chance, a high chance of failure. Like running events was kind of the main thing I did when I was in college. And um, just putting myself out there and actually succeeding was very, it was a really good learning experience, and I think I would never give it up and just play the same crowd anymore. And I think that's honestly the way to live. So, yeah. no, no, something that she she said earlier is you feel the fear and you do it anyway, right? Bravery is about feeling the fear and doing it anyway. You're not going to get anywhere if you don't take risks. You're going to be scared to death. You're going to think, oh my God, I'm an idiot. Oh my God, people are going to laugh at me. You will have all of these feelings, but the difference between growth and not growth, succeeding and failing, is all about whether you feel the fear and do it anyway. Use that shit as rocket fuel, right? You feel that fear and you turn it into something great. And if you fail, you fail spectacularly. And it's so great that everyone's like, ooh. And they just, they respect you. They're like, that is the most amazing thing failure in the world. I mean, how many of you guys are on the internet watching people, you know, bike off of cliffs and crap <laughs> and do these epic fails? It's because you respect how badly they fail, right? That's 
what you got to do. You've got to feel the fear, do it anyway. And if you fail, fail spectacularly so that people respect the failure. And an important part of failure, too, is, I mean, I don't know about you guys. When I was in college, I was studying to be a psych major. I don't know how much I use that in my video game posting day to day, but the important part was, you know, I, I took something that I thought was going to be a big part of me, and I, I ran with it all the way to the finish line, and at the end I was able to look back and say, okay, not for me. I tried it, I gave it my all, and now I'm ready to move on to this next thing that, you know, I got to by trying and failing at all these other things. The, the role of video game event host did not exist when, when I set out to do this. I mean, we, we basically had to be begged, we begged to be let on stage at NASL season one. We're like, please let us hold the microphone, please do stuff too. And they're like, well, yeah, sure, try it. And, um, you know, it, because we were so willing to fail, and also because I had the support of a dear friend. Anna Prosser helped me that day. So many women, so many amazing people that I've worked with have helped me every day. But find a friend and fail together and have a great time doing it. And when you look back and you can, you can see, I did like this, I didn't like that, that's worth working harder on. That just does not come to me naturally, and I am not going in that direction ever again. You know, it's all of those things have, have so much value, and that's time that you invest in yourself. That's what esports needs. If you want to work in video games, if you want to work in esports, we don't need people who are full of potential. We need people who have tried a bunch of things, screwed them up, know not to do that again, and have a really clear idea of what they want to do and what they want to contribute. Because just like I didn't realize what my job would even be or what it could be, and I had to fail a lot of times to get here, the job that you might be doing in two to three years on the esports stage and the gaming stage probably doesn't even exist yet. You have to go and you have to make it up. And the only way you're going to do that is by trying a bunch of other stuff and, and putting together all the good parts. Rod. <laughs> <laughs> um, I also want to go really quickly back to something Kathy said about supporting each other. Um, you talked about how sometimes you're in a situation where you'll hear where women tearing down other women and that your strategy is to take those women aside privately and be like, you know, maybe that isn't cool, maybe you want to slow your roll a little bit. Um, I've found in game development that we need to stick together and we need to build each other up. There is no room in video games for women to tear down other women because there are enough people out there who are tearing women down. And so the more we help each other up, it's like if I do you a favor this time, maybe you'll do me one next time. And you know, there's enough success and enough opportunity for all of us, and we just have to support each other and collaborate. The girls in esports are awesome. Yeah, I have to say, like, holy crap, I actually love all the girls in esports that I've met. Yeah. You know what? It's it's been like. I, I definitely went through my cool girl phase where I was like the girls in your guild where I'm like, I'm one of the guys, man, I don't hang out with bros. And like, you, you kind of have to, you know, it was one of the greatest mistakes of my life is that this girl was being real crummy to me on the internet and I went to her Facebook profile and I was like, I'm going to see what I can be crummy to her about and I accidentally friended her. I <laughs> knew <laughs> <laughs> <Undo> that. <laughs> so I immediately fired up a letter like it was intentional and I was like, hey, I noticed you're saying some stuff and I'd really just love to work it out because I don't really know what it's coming from. And sure, I'm back, she's like, oh, girlfriend, I had no idea. And like total accidental friendship. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that was hugely, was I me? No. <laughs> All I have is worship for you. <laughs> but I mean, it was sort of one of those moments where I'm like, oh my God, you know, I could have added a lot of negativity to the situation. It cost me nothing. And it was so positive to just convert that person. And you know, what a little feather in my cap. But to go further, it costs you nothing to, to you know, like somebody's post or to you know, retweet somebody's thing. This all sounds very you know, unimportant to you guys, but out in the social media world and out in the gaming world and all in the esports and when you're a game company and you're trying to push your stuff, all this is important. And all the, the verbal and visual support that you can do to build each other up, that comes around. Because if you're seen as someone who is positive and encouraging, man, people are going to remember that. In the, in the world of negativity, especially on the internet, you will shine like a star if you can find a way to just be a positive voice. Woo! <laughs> yeah. That's awesome. So, kind of following that line of thought, um, what is it? Are you telling me it's okay to hear this time? Audience. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Apparently, yeah. Uh, <laughs> one of your time. Um, before we do Q&A real quick, I believe we have some gift bags for the panelists. Um, if there are any final thoughts that you guys want to 
share um, with the audience before we launch into Q and A? Can you think about it? Yeah, what Papa said. Go out there and stream and say say you're a gamer if you feel like it. Say you're not if you don't feel like it. Find you. But you know, just uh, be yourself and don't don't um, don't not be out there because we think you don't belong because we need more representation. Of representation. Yeah, yeah. Your group is if you want to make games, just start making them. Don't say, oh, I'd really like to make them. Just start making them. And your first few are going to be really, really bad, okay? <laughs> but you, you're going to need you're going to need that. I would say just absolutely start making games if that's what you want to do. Do, do it now. Do it today. And if you're staying at ACI, you should join VGDC. <laughs> <laughs> it's my video game development club. Lots of students just kind of working together and making games. Like the best way to start making games is just make games. Like I had no idea what I was doing coming onto this campus. I had no idea. Well, I knew a little bit how to program next to my dad, but I didn't take any classes for anything. So just jump in there and do it. And um, something that happens at this school every once in a while is you're the only girl in the group. They automatically put you as the illustrator, or you know, <laughs> you're like, oh, you're the artist. You can draw. Um, yeah, make our logo. And if you want to program, tell. Tell them, like, no, I want to program, I want to do things that you're doing, I want to design the levels, and if they don't let you, talk to the professor. Like, you know, that's not okay. So, yeah, just make games if you want to make games. Say what you want, do what you want. The most useful you can be is a fully actualized person on your own. Make your mistakes, learn your lessons, and then please come back to eSports and make us the cool creative thing ever. Because we need all you guys, whether you're just fans, or whether you want to come on the stage, or whether you want to be pro players, or whether you want to go out and, and Bring a bunch of kids from another nation over here and make them a pro Counter Strike team. Whatever you want to do, do it. <laughs> Don't be a turd when you do it, and we'll be so happy to have you. <laughs> Don't be a turd. That's just that's not yeah, that's on our esports flag. It's a <laughs> Can I get a round of applause for the panelists?
She's made me enjoy streaming a lot more, so yeah, it's really great. Sure, yeah, let's move on to the next question. Hey, I'm an indie developer in Irvine. I was wondering if you guys have any advice on like how to make sure the games they make are more inclusive, and especially as like this white guy, I want to make sure I'm you know <laughs> approaching things in a way that doesn't like alienate anyone. Include the community in your design. Um, in the serious games that I made, uh, the first one that I ever made, I was narrative director for a game called Way Forward Elm City Stories, which was a an HIV prevention game targeted at. 11 to 14 year old African American students. And I'm about the furthest thing in the world from a 13 year old <laughs> black girl. And I, I understood very quickly that my efforts to write like them and for them could go very wrong very quickly unless I included them. And what you will notice right away is if you approach people, if you if you go to you know a club that's an LGBTQ club. And you say, you know what, I'm making a game and I really like your input on this. I want to make sure I get it right. They are so thrilled that you ask, first of all, that they're usually going to be happy to help you. And second of all, how cool is it that I get to help somebody design a video game? That's how most people feel about it. So I would just say include folks. Include a variety of opinions. Um, Include a variety of play testers in your process and you know ask people, am I doing this right? I had to love games. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so sorry if this is a bit more of a controversial or controversial question. So Hoffman mentioned earlier, I haven't actually heard this term before, booth babe. Um, so there's a lot of like women on the internet who kind of use the stereotype in their advantage when streaming or doing other things at events, like for boothing. Like I've seen, there was this one stream of a girl, she purposely, she has like a large bust and she purposely like has on stream that says like, we'll do like one jumping jack for a dollar donated or stuff like that. Just, what is your opinion on that if it's like a bad representation of women? Because at the same time I see it and I'm like, they are able to get like three million like, you know, total views on their Twitch, but I just don't know if that's like, I mean, don't worry so much about it. If you don't like it, don't watch it. And um, just remember that she doesn't represent all of us, right? Just like one guy who's an asshole doesn't represent every guy. So it is kind of hard to look at that and be like, I mean, if, if people are really going to put like our entire gender on her, that's not really our problem, right? And uh, if, if, I mean, if that's not what you want to be represented by. So it's really important just to like focus on yourself and uh, focus on what you want to see and kind of be the <laughs> be the stream that you want to be or be the streamer that you want to be and yeah be the streamer you wish to see in the world yes because <laughs> <laughs> I, I when I began my research on this topic I actually had kind of like the same I I had the same assumption I was like okay so you are ruining my life as a female gamer because you misrepresent me on the internet. And um, what I ended up finding, um, and I, I will hopefully no more in four months, so this was just like a pretest I ran like two years ago. I had a survey and I asked people about Twitch streamers and it became pretty obvious that most people do sexually objectify Twitch streamers and so on and so on. And what also became pretty obvious from it was that no matter what kind of streamers they watched, they still thought that the average gamer was more female when they watch female streamers. So in the end, yeah, maybe misrepresentation might be a thing, but A, these women are not doing it because they just love showing everyone their body parts most of the time, right? They do it because they get money for it, and it's easier to make the money that way in this case. I'm not saying it's easy money. I'm saying 80% of viewers on Twitch are probably male, and if that's the way to get 91%. It's 91%. No. 91% of Twitch producers are male. And if this is the way you can you can uh, you can make money and have a job, you know, I'm not gonna judge you for that. Like maybe we should first retry thinking what 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 the audience wants and not blame the people for feeding that demand. And then also even misrepresentation, if we believe it can be representation which in the end might work out well because we're not perceived as a minority as much, which is good. 
So actually, my question is really similar to um, the previous question. And correct me if I'm wrong, but research is not viewed as a traditional game industry uh, career. However, I am so interested in doing research. Um, more specifically, I'm interested in doing economic research. And I know like Val hires economists, right? So for a student like me trying to break into a non-traditional career in game gaming, so to speak, what can I do um, to like pioneer that new path? Because I don't, I, I don't believe um, academic research in games is very big right now. But I still want to do it because I'm interested. In it. I just don't know how. Um, I guess if you want to do, I mean, if you want to work for a game company, you need a different set of skill set. But you can acquire that in a graduate program. And I do know that, for example, Bell, they do hire economists. But for the researching positions, all of them do like the graduate degrees. So I feel like a master's might help you out there. And if you can get into a data science master's, and if you're good with numbers, that would be the way to go, I think. Learn R, learn SQL, um, know these things. And um, I think there's a lot of money to make in the game industry with this skill set, particularly data science right now. Like I know for a fact because a bunch of my friends are hiring like crazy. Like they're all like, data science, you wanna come work for us? <laughs> so yeah, R and SQL are your friends and Python's thing. <laughs> okay, our time's really limited. So let's say if we can go fire around on these ones. So you girls have mentioned that um, girls are just or kind of just mentioned gaming just because we haven't been playing for as long. Um, do you think like all female leagues would help remedy that, or do you think that would just further the disparity? I think all female leagues get some people angry sometimes, but as someone who competed in an all female plan for a while, the benefit of that was having a small community and being able to kind of practice and bounce it off each other before you took it out into the big wide world of online tournaments. And so if, if certain groups would stop getting so mad about these, these smaller kinds of tournaments, I think they'd be great. But right now they're, they're, they're super contentious and I, I hate the negative attention it gives you know, some people who, who want to play in it and they just want to play and all of a sudden they're, they're caught up in some online controversy. So 
I think in practice they're fantastic. I came up through an all female community and it was the best thing I could have asked for. So, uh, you know, I, I hope I would love to try it and see. And I think that's where we're all at right now. So as an Asian American growing up, I was pushed towards the pre-med path up until actually this last December. Um, and I wasn't able to complain to my parents that I wanted to go into the gaming industry because I was just so terrified to tell them. Um, I actually still didn't tell my mom, I only told my dad. <laughs> so this is going on YouTube, so you might as well. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to ask, like, what kind of hardships that you guys had to go through to tell your family or your close ones, like, that you wanted to go into this industry? Oh man, I used to just sneak into my parents' room, to, like plug in the router, <laughs> rinse and everything. I used to skip I was, I was not. A, I'm sorry. I, got, like, I, got, like, I purposely got one of my like friends who's like text savvy to hack computers because it was like password protected. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just to like go on the internet. Yeah. Same. Yeah. No, I mean I was just a really bad kid. I don't know. I was not a disaster. My parents like they would yell at me. I'd get grounded. I'd accept that I got grounded. But I I think I showed my mom like my rankings. And I was like, look, I'm really actually good at this. And we have free rides, all these tournaments during the summer. And as soon as I showed her like, that it wasn't just like mindless, mindlessness, uh, they became really supportive. And they were really unsupportive when I got to college. Sorry, I didn't know about the college. <laughs> but uh, I mean, once I showed them that it was like, a steady career and then that, that there was a future and it was something that I was passionate about and I loved, like, they just want the best for you. Like, at the end of the day, your parents love you, right? And they just want to see you succeed. And if you can show them that you can succeed in something that you really care about and then you love, then I think they will support you. I mean, when I got hired into the games industry, my dad's reaction was, oh, I hope you can sleep at night making all that bread that thought of crap. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, good God, Dad, I make educational games for children. That's not the business at all. And to this day, he still really kind of doesn't get what I do. He thinks I do something with computers. That's what he tells people that I do something with computers. Um, and my mom hasn't played any of the games that I have made because she's not that much of a gamer. But they're glad that I'm happy. They're glad that I like it. And I think they're just happy that I that I am passionate enough about something to drive myself to succeed at it. I think that's the, the really the only thing that matters. Um, so I don't really have an important question. I just have. I was just curious about this. So, um, do any of you guys play Overwatch? And if so, who do you main? <laughs> I mean, I play Overwatch, but I mean, you know, you don't main people in Overwatch. Right? You gotta switch for the team. But I'm yeah. like, <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, nice. That's, that's cool. I just want to see y'all. Anybody serve same character? I, I play. Yeah. Yeah, I'm only level 13, so I'm not going to answer that question. <laughs> Hi, uh, my name is Howard. I'd like to thank all of the, uh, the panelists for coming here today and talking with us. Uh, one of my earliest memories as a kid was seeing my mom, like, crush Pac-Man. But the problem <laughs> was, um, my mom's a Vietnamese woman, and I was just interested on if you guys know anything going down about women in gaming, like, internationally, maybe in Japan, maybe in Asia, maybe in Europe. So uh, this is the one thing I wish I knew more about, and I should have read the article but again before I came here, but I hear uh, Diva is inspiring a lot of South Koreans to make uh, gaming more inclusive in South Korea, to make South Korea a place where Diva can happen and be born in that future as a uh, top professional gamer. So uh, video games making life better for potential future uh, made up video game characters. <laughs> <laughs> If women around the world want to make games, uh, there is the Global Game Jam that happens every year, and there are locations that happen all over the world that people can sign up for and get together with people and make games. And there are also chapters of the Professional Association, the IGBA, where game developers from all over the world can meet and network with each other and collaborate. Let me say real quick that you see Irvine, the Global Game Jam site. You should totally come out next year. Okay, so this will be our last question. Thank you very much for sharing your experiences. I am a longtime member of the UCI community. I'm really excited that we have eSports here now. And I'm wondering if you can give us some tips on how to make 
UCI eSports, gender inclusive, URM inclusive, and just a place where everybody feels that they can come and excel. Well, I can speak to that a little bit, maybe. Um, uh, we definitely, that's something that we're working on all the time. Um, something that I think we'll be really excited to announce when it's ready is we want to work on creating pipelines for young women to get more involved. So things like summer camps, after school programs, that's something we're looking at. Um, just generally, we want to make the arena a very friendly space. So we love feedback from people. Um, I know some people have come in and just are afraid to step in because it kind of seems like a hardcore gamer hub when you come in sometimes. You walk in and there's people shouting and they're like playing all these competitive games. But a lot of us just like hanging out with friends when we play. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's so successful, the arena. Um, just having a place for people to gather. And um, I just encourage people to come out and like experience it before you decide it's not for you. And um, if you have any comments on that, I would love to hear it. Like panelists too, if you guys have thoughts. Like I would love to hear it. I know I have like a really friendly stream chat. Do you ever come to my stream? It's really friendly. <laughs> and um, part of it is uh, actually in a huge LGBT community, and it's because I'm really careful with my words. And um, I think that's something rare in gaming. Like, I think people say really hateful stuff online. They don't mean it in a, in a bad way, but you just say a lot of like racist or sexist or like, you know, just crap. And um, yeah, I think watching your language. Um, I mean, I swear a lot, right? <laughs> like, swearing, I don't know. It's, it's not like hateful. I, I think like watching your hateful speech uh, goes a long way. I don't know what resources you guys have to do this, but uh, having ambassadors that can kind of, you know, have one-on-one -on -one interactions with people, you know, they kind of, you said you have kind of a chaotic, inclusive environment, and you know, I'm sure you have those people that stand on the edges, and you're like, what is that going on in there? Like, if you can hit that person right when they're curious and talk to them and say, hey, come on in, like, that is, that's the best time to, to bring in a new person, and so it's really resource intensive, but it's something that sort of everyone that's already involved in your community can be encouraged to do, where if you see someone that's curious, you know, just talk about what's going on, talk about what's going, you know, what's happening in there, and that person can think in their own head how they want to be involved, what skills do they have to offer this new community, and, and they can really see, you know, is this a place I want to be. Yeah, our good luck ambassador is like Hoppo. Approach streamers that stream the games that you're having these collegiate leagues for, teams for, and win them over as ambassadors, and have them say, hey, come to UCI. You can actually study and make money. <laughs> <laughs> All of you. I don't put in UCI. I know. <laughs> We're just going to stall you here. We're going to pull this up. You'll be on um, the Arena TV. Um, so everybody, let's get another round of applause. <laughs> Thank you.